The disruption of habitats in the UK is causing huge problems for a lot of our native wildlife species. For our six native reptiles, many of whom have specific habitat and dietary requirements, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation are large causes in population declines. But what do the terms habitat loss and habitat fragmentation actually mean? And how do they impact each of our native reptiles specifically? That's what we're going to be exploring in this video today. Now this is another video where I've compiled a lot of information from many different scientific papers. So if you're interested in reading further into anything that I'm talking about today, I have compiled a list of references below for you to check out. Subscribe to Ferroforest to keep learning about UK nature. A habitat is the collective environmental features that support the reproduction and survival of a species, such as food resources, weather patterns, and the organisms in the surrounding area. Simply put, a habitat is an animal's home. UK reptiles, like other species, have specific conditions that need to be met to be able to survive within their habitat. When habitats are disrupted, their conditions can change. If these conditions deviate too far away from the reptile's preferred conditions, the habitat will no longer be able to support their survival. UK reptiles have had their habitats disrupted in recent years, both by habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. But before we can understand how our reptiles specifically have been impacted, we need to understand what the terms habitat loss and habitat fragmentation actually mean. Habitat loss is when a habitat becomes incapable of supporting its species. When this happens, a species is either displaced, meaning it must move away and live in different, less ideal conditions, or the species dies because there are no more suitable conditions for them to live in. Either way, habitat loss reduces the amount of species that a region can support, and so is one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss. In the last 100 years, habitats in the UK have been lost at an alarming rate. Over 65% of land is used for agriculture and 8% is built on, which means there isn't much room left for nature. What was once natural habitat has been changed by the pressures of intensive agriculture, poor woodland management, climate change, urbanisation, pollution, hydrological changes and the introduction of invasive non-native species. These pressures have resulted in the average loss of roughly 75% of ponds, 97% of wildflower meadows, 50% of hedgerows, 50% of ancient woodlands, 75% of heathlands, and 98% of lowland raised bogs. This reduction in habitat has contributed to the loss of 13% of our native species, with a further 15% threatened with extinction. For the majority of the habitats that are remaining, regardless of whether or not they exist in protected areas, their conditions are still considered unfavourable to wildlife compared to what they could be. Sadly, habitat loss isn't the only disruption happening to UK habitats. Habitat fragmentation is another threat to wildlife and is a little bit more complicated. As different pressures change our landscape, Large blocks of habitat are disrupted and broken into smaller patches, which exist within a mosaic of natural and human modified land. The word fragmentation specifically refers to the altered spatial composition of the habitat, where once there was a single large block of habitat, there are now multiple smaller blocks of different shapes. In a theoretical scenario, fragmentation is just talking about this spatial change and does not necessarily mean that the overall amount of land has reduced, and so no habitat loss needs to take place. In reality, habitat fragmentation and habitat loss go hand in hand. A large, single, historical habitat will have a city or a farm built on it, or sections will become polluted or become uninhabitable by native species for various other reasons. This means that these parts of the habitat are lost, which is habitat loss, and also that the spatial shape of the previous block of habitat has been broken down, which is habitat fragmentation. But why is this fragmentation an issue for wildlife? Well, imagine you have a breeding population of grass snakes in this patch of remaining habitat. Then someone decides to build a road straight through it. Now the grass snakes have no access to the other side. The entirety of the initial land fragment has experienced habitat loss with the creation of the road, so the landscape can support less individuals. But the fragmentation has additional impacts. Firstly, with unsuitable habitat on all sides, the grass snakes are stuck where they are, unable to leave and find out if there is suitable habitat elsewhere. 
There is also now less distance between the ideal centre of the habitat, where conditions are perfect for grass snakes, and the outer edges, where conditions are closer to those in neighbouring habitats that can't support them. This increases the chance of grass snakes not surviving due to being in contact with a variety of less favourable conditions, such as their prey species existing in lesser numbers on the outer edges of their fragment, pollution seeping in from adjacent urban areas, or a higher chance that a predator can find them in less dense cover. This means that some grass snakes will have died that otherwise would have had the space to survive in the ideal centre part of the habitat. This then spirals into even more effects, because fragmentation also means that grass snakes on either side of the road can no longer meet. A once healthy breeding population, with plenty of mating options, is now limited in who they can mate with. In many cases of habitat fragmentation across the world, this results in too little breeding being able to take place between unrelated snakes, and so in a few generations the effects of inbreeding will kick in, meaning that not enough healthy individuals are being born and the population will collapse. Despite some habitat being left, the combined impacts of fragmentation and habitat loss have resulted in grass snakes going extinct in this location. Unfortunately, habitat fragmentation often leads to further habitat fragmentation, setting into motion a cycle of events that ends in total habitat destruction unless we can intervene. Using the example that I just showed of my grass snake animation, often if you put in one road, it may not actually cause the grass snakes to go locally extinct. However, this one road means that there's now better access to the area, and so a housing development might be started. Putting in extra housing causes further habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. However, it doesn't just stop there. The people who move into these houses will want to be served locally by schools, shops and farms, and so further chunks are going to be cut out of the habitat. This extra urbanisation will eventually lead to an increase in pollution, which will disrupt all of the habitat surrounding it and start degrading them so they look a lot more barren. A lack of investment into proper habitat management means that decisions can often be made to just remove barren patches of habitat rather than maintain them properly so that people don't start complaining about what they look like. And so the cycle goes on and on until eventually the grass snakes do become so impacted that they become locally extinct. It's often not just one development that causes a problem. However, by putting in just one more development here and just one more development there, over time, there will eventually be compounding effects that does lead to a catastrophic problem. Now that we know what habitat loss and habitat fragmentation are, how are they impacting wildlife in the UK? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because so many different effects combine together to impact wildlife populations and telling the impacts apart specifically from habitat loss and specifically from habitat fragmentation can be quite tricky. However, we do have lots of both habitat loss and habitat fragmentation happening in the UK. In our forests alone, 37% of trees are within 30 metres of the habitat edge, and 74% are within 100 metres of the habitat edge. This means that a considerable proportion of forest habitats in the UK are suffering the pressures of being edge habitat, with differences in features like soil composition, temperature and humidity compared to the core of the forest. This has had proven impacts on the composition of bird communities, changing which species are present in which proportions. Urbanisation has fragmented habitats in the UK that specialised species rely on, such as the heathlands in southern England where sand lizards live. All the way up on the other side of the UK, in the northeast of Scotland, the capercaillie is also under threat from urbanisation because it has such a small home range that when its habitat is lost, it can't always travel to the next suitable available habitat spot. Habitat loss and fragmentation are major causes in the decline of almost 100 reptile species in Europe, including our native reptiles here in the UK. Unfortunately, the majority of habitat fragmentation studies are looking at the impacts on birds, mammals or invertebrates, and rarely ever are reptile communities studied. However, I have compiled some of what we do know about the impact of habitat disruption on the UK to discuss in the rest of this video. Common lizards are in decline due to habitat loss, 
the reduction in structural variation in vegetation, and also the impact of habitat fragmentation caused by urbanisation and agricultural intensification. Like all reptiles in the UK, common lizards are protected by law, but very few sites have been set aside specifically to manage them. A study in France found that it was smaller habitat features disappearing that most impacted common lizards, things such as ditches or piles of dead wood. When these disappear, common lizards gradually become further isolated into their preferred habitat that remains. These small habitat features often exist in brownfield sites, where urban development has previously happened but has since been abandoned, such as unused railway lines. In urban areas, it's often these brownfield sites that function as the last refuge for common lizards. Brownfield site development often removes small habitat features that common lizards rely on and can cause local populations of small amounts of lizards to disappear. Meanwhile, over in Northern Ireland, habitats like heathlands, bogs and coastal regions are being threatened with conversion to agricultural and urban sites. Common lizards are often associated with these habitats, and so the remaining Northern Ireland populations are predicted to be small, isolated and surviving in highly fragmented habitats. Sand lizards have suffered much more dramatic declines due to habitat loss and fragmentation. Very few natural populations still exist, and the ones that do are set aside on sites managed specifically for them. Over a hundred years ago, developments had already begun to impact sand lizard populations, with no reports of them in North Wales occurring later than 1914. By the time a paper was written in 1979 on sand lizards, the North England population had fallen from roughly 9,000 individuals to only a few hundred. Of 49 known sand lizard sites, 25 had been lost due to habitat loss from building activities, and 36 in total had been destroyed. 10 populations were too low to be able to survive long term, and only the three remaining sites had viable long-term breeding populations. This paper predicted that by 2020, sand lizard suitable habitats would be completely gone in the UK and they would become locally extinct. Thankfully, that didn't happen, but only because we intervened and we conserved habitats like this. Although sand lizards are still very rare in the UK, work is continuing to be done to conserve them. However, I'll be going into a lot more detail about what happened with sand lizards in another video. For now, let's move on to the next reptile. Slow worms, despite being our most commonly encountered reptile, are under threat from habitat disruption. We know that urban developments pose a significant threat to them because when surveys are being done on future construction sites, these are the reptiles that are most commonly encountered. Construction processes, such as vegetation clearance, ground removal, machinery tracking and debris removal all cause habitat loss for slow worms. However, they might not be so impacted by habitat fragmentation. Slow worms have a typically small home range moving only between 30 and 50 metres and it's only really a few sub-adults that tend to go a bit further looking for new habitat to colonise. A study also found in 2011 that slow worms don't actually sow any significantly noticeable negative impacts in their genetics from inbreeding when they live in smaller populations. This combined with their small home range suggests that slow worms can actually survive on smaller habitat fragments without too much concern compared to our other reptiles. The grass snake is a species with a wider home range. There isn't a lot of information about their population trends, but it's thought that habitat loss and fragmentation are causing declines in their populations. Many farm ponds have been filled in due to agricultural intensification, which has caused amphibian populations to decline, and so grass snakes have less food available to them. Grass snakes also favour returning to the same breeding sites each year, so losing habitat patches that contain breeding sites results in less snakes surviving to adulthood. A genetic study on grass snakes found that they're capable of moving through human altered landscapes to breed with other populations, so habitat fragmentation may be less of a concern for this species. However, because habitat disruption does still impact them, the authors of this study suggest that to maintain grass snake populations, it's important to maintain habitat mosaics in place where there is habitat left. This means that within the habitat, there should be a variety of features available to grass snakes, such as ponds where their amphibian food source can breed and compost heaps where the snakes themselves can breed. 
Although grass snakes can travel between habitat patches, their populations won't survive without this variety of habitat features. Another snake in the UK is the adder. Adders are largely in decline due to agricultural intensification causing habitat loss and fragmentation. Adders prefer to bask in open habitats, so the reduction of heathland and moorland across much of the UK has caused them to disappear from some regions. One study on a population of adders living in fragmented habitats found that any populations separated by more than three kilometres were relatively genetically isolated, and even those that were closer still showed up as distinct subpopulations. This means that unless the fragment is within one kilometer of another suitable piece of habitat, adders won't colonize new areas and habitat fragmentation will cause them to suffer declines because they won't be able to grow and survive in the face of habitat disruption. Finally, let's have a look at how our rarest snake is impacted by habitat disruption. In the UK, up to 90% of our heathland has been lost due to increases in urban populations agricultural intensification, forest succession, fires and erosion. Smooth snakes suffer from this loss of heathlands because they have very specific habitat requirements, so much so that heathlands are now considered a priority habitat and most sites are protected by triple SI or SAC designation. If you want to know more about what those designations mean, I discussed it during my second bat video, which you can find on my channel. Studies suggest that smooth snakes are more impacted by habitat loss than by habitat fragmentation. One study found that smooth snake populations in heathlands were more affected by the increases in tree cover and the increases in bare ground than they were by the fragmentation of the heathland. This suggests that smooth snakes can persist on heathland fragments so long as the conditions remain right but if the conditions were to change, then the smooth snakes become in decline because of the effects of habitat loss. A study backs this up by showing that smooth snakes in heathlands tend to have quite sedentary lifestyles and aren't impacted genetically by that. So long as the smooth snake has conditions that are able to be met within that small habitat fragment on the heathland, they don't require a lot of connectivity with other populations or room to roam in order to survive. With the different ways that our reptiles, as well as many other UK species, are affected by habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, what can we actually do to stop these negative impacts? Habitat loss in the UK can be mitigated in three ways. We can either create new habitat, restore or enhance existing habitat, or accelerate how habitats evolve until they meet the requirements we're looking for. The exact method that we deploy depends on the specific circumstances, with factors such as the size of the remaining habitats and the species composition within them being important to consider. Our management of the land can even help regain habitat that's already been lost. For example, in most heathlands, reptiles benefit from a lower intensity grazing management, and when it's more intense grazing, they tend to be negatively impacted. By reducing the amount of areas that are overgrazed, we can regain the vegetation structural variants in the heathlands, and this allows reptiles to benefit from more different basking and sheltering locations. Habitat fragmentation can be mitigated by creating corridors that work around the disruptive fragments. For example, animals can cross roads with the help of badger tunnels underneath or aerial runways above. Larger animals can cross roads using habitat bridges. Buffer zones around remaining habitats can reduce the impact of living on the edge by protecting the species inside from effects like pollution. Once these mitigations are in place, we can give populations a boost by performing genetic rescue. This is where inbreeding is counteracted by the introduction of additional individuals to breed with the population and reduces the impact of inbreeding over time. This has been found to work for adder populations in Sweden. Remember that not all urban and farming areas are bad, and not all species are negatively impacted by living on smaller fragments. Some species thrive in urban and farming environments, and some species prefer to live on the edges of habitats, whereas others can only exist in untouched environments or deep in the core of habitats. Conserving land that benefits all of our wildlife species is a really complicated process that needs to take into account a lot of factors related to all of the different species as well as human desires. But I hope that this video has helped introduce you to the concept of habitat loss and fragmentation and how they could pose a threat to some of our UK reptiles. 
If you want to learn more about UK wildlife, then check out some of the other videos on my channel.